Well, please remain standing for the reading of God's Word. Turn, if you will, to Genesis chapter 14. You'll find that on page 10 in your Pew Bible. Genesis 14, page 10 in the Pew Bible, reading the first 16 verses. Let's give our attention then to God's holy and inspired word. In the days of Amraphel, king of Shinar, Ariok, king of Elasar, Kedor Laameh, king of Elam, and Tidal, king of Goim, these kings made war with Bera, king of Sodom, Bersha, king of Gomorrah, Shinab, king of Adma, Shemabeh, king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, that is Zoar. And all these joined forces in the valley of Sidim, that is, the Salt Sea. Twelve years they had served Kedolaomer, but in the thirteenth year they rebelled. In the fourteenth year, Kedolaomer and the kings who were with him came and defeated the Rephaim in Ashtaroth Karnaim, the Zuzim in Ham, the Emim in Shavak Kiriathim, and the Horites in the hill country of Seir, as far as El Paran, on the border of the wilderness. Then they turned back and came to En Mispat, that is Kadesh, and defeated all the country of the Amalekites and also the Amorites who were dwelling in Hazazon Tamar. Then the king of Sodom, the king of Gomorrah, the king of Admah, the king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, that is Zoar, went out, and they joined battle in the valley of Sidim with Kedolaomer, king of Elam, Tidal king of Goim, Amraphel king of Shinar, and Ariok king of Elasar, four kings against five. Now the valley of Sidim was full of bitumen pits, and as the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled, some fell into them, and the rest fled to the hill country. So the enemy took all the possessions of Sodom and Gomorrah, and all their provisions, and went their way. They also took Lot, the son of Abram's brother, who was dwelling in Sodom and his possessions, and went their way. Then one who had escaped came and told Abram the Hebrew, who was living by the oaks of Mamre the Amorite, brother of Eschol and Aner. These were allies of Abram. When Abram heard that his kinsmen had been taken captive, he led forth his trained men born in his house, 318 of them, and went in pursuit as far as Dan. And he divided his forces against them by night, he and his servants, and defeated them, and pursued them at Hobar, north of Damascus. Then he brought back all the possessions and also brought back his kinsman Lot with his possessions and the women and the people. Thanks be to God for his word. Let's pray. Lord, we pray now that as we come to somewhat unusual portions of your word, that you might open my mouth and open all our ears and hearts, that we might see you, our great sovereign God, who directs all things that shall come to pass, and does so for the glory of your name, for the righteousness of your name, for the good of your people, even unto bringing Christ as our Lord and our Savior. Have mercy then upon the word and the preaching of it, and work in our hearts, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Well, we have before us a rather dramatic uh, passage from Genesis. We have nation rising against nation. We have Lot taken into captivity. We have Abram, a transformed man from chapter 13, uh, jumping up, springing into action as a deliverer of Lot. Many themes, many lessons from God's judgment on the nations to God's chastening hand upon his people to a very picture of Christ, a very picture of salvation and redemption from the captivity to sin. And yet every action 
uh, every movement of this text takes us back to the actions and intentions of Almighty God. How God enacts justice upon the wicked. How he cares for his children. How he shows us in this narrative, once again, the need for salvation and the only means for salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we're called to look at the details of this text. We're called to look at the movement of this text. And then we're called to look beyond them to the picture of our Lord and Savior as he keeps, saves, and sustains his people. Very clearly, there are two distinct scenes in these first 16 verses. Uh, there's what happens in the first 11 verses, maybe the first 12 verses, which is a narrative of rebellion and of judgment. Rebellion and judgment. And then in verse 12 to verse 16, we have a narrative of chastening and deliverance or redemption, if you want. God acting in the judging of the nations, God acting in the chastening and deliverance of his people through Abraham. First of all, rebellion and judgment. As we come to this passage, it would be helpful for us to go back four chapters just very briefly where we witness the separation of Noah's sons, the table of the nations as they separated into clans and into tribes. Here we meet many kings and many tribal nations, kings of city-states seeking dominion over each other. Uh, these are all direct descendants of Noah and of Noah's sons. This is, in a sense, uh, inter-family rivalry and warfare, uh, and yet we see the family idea has long since passed as they wage war against each other. Uh, and here we have a picture of mankind, the history of mankind, in a nutshell, in fact. Conflict, ego, war, rebellion and the judgment of Almighty God upon the wickedness of man. Here we see the nations raging against each other, uh, indeed the nations raging against God, kings and rulers setting themselves up. And yet we know from Scripture that it's not the kings who are setting themselves up. I'm reminded of the words of Daniel as he prays, uh, to God Almighty in chapter 2, blessed be the name of God forever and ever, to whom belong wisdom and might. He changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. And perhaps you notice as we read and as we'll continue to read in verse 17 in the coming weeks, uh, the word king, uh, I'm told, um, appears 28 times in this text. It is a chapter of kings raising themselves up and being cast down. Five kings of Canaan, four kings of Mesopotamia, Abram functioning as a king over his family, Melchizedek in the next passage, the priest king of Salem. Of course, both Abram and Melchizedek pointing us to the king of kings, the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, as kings make themselves known in the history of man. It is God. It is God Almighty who raises them up and casts them down. And so this passage is not just about morals, how we should live, don't be like Lot, though it is about that. It's about the sovereign direction of the history of mankind for the good of God's covenant people and the glory of his name. And so we witness firstly a nation raging against nation and God's judgment brought on both sides of this conflict. Note this, the rebels of Canaan who rebel against the Mesopotamian kings who come in and invade the country, both of them end up being overthrown. Both of them end up being crushed. Those wicked kings that have set themselves against their fellow man and ultimately against God, both sets of people are judged here in this narrative. 
The narrative commences with the details of the sides. It's the days of Amraphel, king of Shinna. There are kings in Mesopotamia, probably somewhere around Babylon and going up into northern Iraq. Evidently, they have invaded previously, and the kings of Canaan are paying them tribute, uh, paying to keep them happy, essentially. And these kings of Canaan get fed up of paying that tribute. Twelve years they've been paying it. In the 13th year, they rebel. In the 14th year, led by, it seems, Kedolaomer, king of Elam, the four Mesopotamian kings come into the promised land, into Canaan, and bring warfare and destruction. And you'll note verse 5 onwards, they're not just coming to attack the five kings of Canaan. We read there in verse 5, In the fourteenth year, Kedolaomer and the kings who were with him came and defeated the Rephaim. Now these are not the kings that are rebelling. These are just nations they meet on the way and they bring destruction and oppression. They defeated the Rephaim in Ashtaroth Karnaim, the Zuzim in Ham, the Emim in Shavath Kiriathaim, and the Horites in the hill country of Seir. And then they go down to the south of the promised land. Verse 7, then they turned back and came to En Mispat, and they defeated all the country of the Amalekites and also the Amorites. You see, this Babylonian force, it seems, comes sweeping into Israel, or what will become Israel, and sweeps all before them. Just like centuries later, Babylon would come again, invade the land of Israel and the land of Judah, and carry them off into captivity. Caught in the middle of this mess is Lot. Not Abraham. There's no sense of threat here to Abraham, even though this Babylonian force has gone right from the north of the country to the south, destroying all before it. Lot is caught up in the middle of it. Not Abraham. But an interesting byproduct of this invading force is that the nations dwelling in the promised land are substantially weakened. All those kings we read in verse 2 following, all those tribes in verse 5 following are inhabiting the promised land which has been given to Abraham and his descendants. We must think it must have been easier after the invasion for Abraham to inherit the land than it was before. And so in verse 8, we come to the fact that the kings of Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, Zeboim, and Bela, the five kings of Canaan, They come together and enter the fray. And the outcome of their rebellion against the Mesopotamian kings, frankly, is disaster. The five kings enter the fray, we're told, and they join the battle against the invading kings. We're told, verse 9, four kings against five. And the battle does not go well for the Canaanite kings. They're routed they flee. We're told there in verse 9 and verse 10 that the valley of Sidim, where they met for battle, was filled with tar pits, bitumen, probably boiling hot pits of tar dotted around the landscape. And as the Mesopotamian kings come in to meet, bat- to meet them in battle, they're scattered. And some of them, we read, fall into these tar pits as they're trying to escape. Others take uh, refuge in the hillside. Perhaps some of your English translations say that they didn't just fall into the tar pits, but they threw themselves into the tar pits. There's a suggestion there in the Hebrew, and some English translations pick up on this, that in their attempt to escape the terror of falling into the hands of Kedolaomer and his fellow kings, they would rather boil themselves alive in these tar pits and be subject to the cruelty and wickedness of these Mesopotamian kings. Either way, a good number are destroyed in these boiling pits of bitumen. Others flee into the hill country. And the rout is completed by verse 11. So the enemy, that's the Mesopotamians, took all the possessions of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their provisions and went there way. Pagan kings rebelling and fighting against other 
pagan kings and destruction comes. We need to understand this, brethren, under the providential hand of God, that God uses the wickedness of man to judge the wickedness of man. You see, the conduct of the people of Sodom and Gomorrah, their kings, and those about him in their relations to each other is duplicated in their relations to their kings, those kings over them, rebelling against each other, rebelling against God. Oh, we're talking about stiff-necked people whose hearts were set upon gross wickedness. 13.13 reads this, Now the men of Sodom were wicked, great sinners against the Lord. And their lifestyle in Sodom and their relations outside of their city precipitated their own destruction. The judgment is they're slain in battle and scattered. The judgment is their cities are ransacked. All the possessions of Sodom and Gomorrah are taken. All their provisions. And great numbers of people carried off as slaves. Do you see what's happening? God raising nation against nation, kings raised up, kings cast down. This is a picture of judgment, of God judging the people. And yet it's a picture of something greater than temporal judgment, is it not? It's a picture of eternal judgment. We're told that those who ultimately remain and die in rebellion against God will be held to account for all their activities, all their words, all their thoughts, and will face an end far worse than the bitumen pits of the Valley of Sedim. We're not told in the final judgment of tar pits. We're told of a lake which burns with fire. We're told of a second death. We're told of an eternal death. The book of Revelation is very clear on this matter. Revelation 20 verse 12. I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. The dead are judged according to what they have done. And we'll read in Revelation 22, verse 8, 21, verse 8, sorry. As for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. And dear friend, if you're without Christ here today and you think, well, I'm not so bad as all that, I've not actually committed adultery, I've not actually murdered someone, Oh, dear friend, you need to know that just like us, you have broken every command of Almighty God in your heart, with your mouth, and probably with your hands. The lifestyle and actions of Sodom and Gomorrah brought upon them judgment. And so too is your rebellion against Almighty God, sure and certain to bring upon you judgment. And dear friend, you have a choice today. You have a choice today. You can remain in your rebellion if you want. But we would not have you ignorant of the consequences of such. We would not have you ignorant of remaining in your rebellion. Assuredly, as the people of Sodom and Gomorrah were brought to this judgment here, so too will the unrepentant rebellious be brought to the final judgment of which we have just read. And God calls upon you now to repent. To repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. You see, what we see here in Sodom and Gomorrah is but a picture of what will come to pass in the last day. These temporal judgments, which bring great pain and suffering upon people because they deserve it before God, are a picture of what is to come. 
And yet these temporal judgments, sometimes we find the covenant people caught up in them, don't we? Certainly we do here. When the covenant people, and it's important that we all hear this, when the covenant people look too much like the world, they are often caught up in the judgments of the world. When we look too much like the world, we will find God treating us like the world in order that we will turn. And while that's unpleasant, ultimately it is always for our good and our deliverance and the glory of God. We're talking about chastening of the Christian chastening and deliverance, which we see really in verse 12 to verse 16. You'd see in verse 12 that the Lord, in His providence, has Lot caught up in the mess of these rivalries and battles. Verse 12, they also took Lot, the son of Abram's brother who was dwelling in Sodom, and his possessions, and went there way. Because of Lot's friendship with the world, he is caught up in the judgment of God on the world. Young people, you need to pay special attention to this. Very careful attention. If you're in your teens, colleges, and beyond that, friendship with the world, Scripture says, is enmity with God. And Lot is on the brink of being at enmity with God. Indeed, some of his household were. You cannot be friends with the world and at ease in the world and at ease in the presence of God. Part of the judgment on the kings is that all they have, verse 11, is taken from them. And Lot also, because of his close proximity to Sodom, he also, a covenant member, is carted off with them in an exile, as it were, long before the Babylonians took God's people into exile. And we can learn much about Lot. We're going to come back to him in a few chapters. The Apostle Peter calls him righteous Lot. It's often hard to see that, isn't it? But he says he's righteous. He's a believer. Horribly weak. Horribly immature. Foolish. Not knowing his right hand from his left hand. It even says he was greatly distressed in 2 Peter 7. Greatly distressed by the sensual conduct of the wicked in Sodom. And yet not distressed enough to leave there. To remove himself. To remove his family from them and yet because he believes however weak his faith is however much sin he puts into his relationship with God it cannot actually sever the tie between God and his children that's very important no matter what the Christian the true sincere Christian does we cannot sever that tie we cannot break that bond And we see that played out for us here in the deliverance of Lot by a redeemer, Abraham. There's a physical redemption here of Lot and a spiritual picture of redemption in the Lord Jesus Christ. Abraham is the peculiar focus of the text. One escapes and bears the news to Abraham that Lot has been captured. Uh, Immediately, uh, Abraham uh, springs into action. In in striking contrast to his behavior and conduct on the way down into Egypt, where frankly Abraham was a bit of a coward, if truth be told, and he was dishonest to boot, here there's nothing about his wavering in faith. He simply jumps into action, rallies his men, 318 of them, and goes out to war. And he pursues them probably a distance of about 150, 175 miles to chase after the kings of Mesopotamia and retrieve Lot. Abraham is now faith-filled. He had faith before, but his faith is strong now at this point. He's one king, as it were, against four kings. He's got 318 men, presumably against many thousands of men. Vastly outnumbered. 
vastly outgunned, so to speak. Humanly speaking, little chance of winning this battle. And more so, there's no record whatsoever of Abraham ever being a man of war. Humanly speaking, the odds are stacked against him. And he goes against an army of four kings that routed an army of five kings. Brethren, that's faith. That's a transformed faith. If ever there was testimony to the sanctifying and emboldening of the Holy Spirit in the child of God's life, this is it. It's not the chief point of the text, Abraham's sanctified faith coming to the fore, but it is a point in the text. It's often said in sports and elsewhere, in fact, that we learn more by our losses than we do our victories. And that's true spiritually also. As Margaret Clarkson once wrote, grace grows best in winter. Under harsh conditions, under difficult conditions, our graces grow more frank, often than in times of blessing. God teaches us more often through our failures than he does our apparent successes. Abraham's Egypt episode, his cowardice, his dishonesty, and God bringing him out of Egypt, filled to the brim with possessions, has taught him that God is faithful. And that God's faithfulness even overcomes our sin. And that God does not deal with his people according to their sins. But mounts up and piles up blessing upon blessing. So simply we're told he goes out to battle. He gets the message. He goes out. Uh, the brevity of the text is de designed to convey his certainty, his assurance of faith that God is with him. And that he will do what he must do. And he makes his force at one level even weaker. 318 men, he divides it into two, attacks them by night, and we read this. And he defeated them and pursued them to Hobah, north of Damascus. Abram and his small band of men routed the four kings of Mesopotamia. And verse 16, then he brought back all the possessions and also brought back his kinsman Lot with his possessions and the women and the people. <coughs> Not really a good idea to go head to head with Abraham, is it? Pharaoh tried it. Look what happened to him. Abraham just keeps getting wealthier and wealthier and wealthier. The grace of God. And Lot is brought back with his entire household. Everything he lost is brought back and Abraham's household is enlarged all the more. I said here there's a spiritual lesson. I want to bring that out now as we bring this to a conclusion. First of all, do we not see the mercy and the grace of Almighty God to one of his errant children, Lot? The mercy and the grace of Almighty God Scripture tells us many times over, and I'm sure by now if you've been a Christian for any length of time, you can also testify to the fact that God has not dealt with you, dear friend, according to your iniquities. He has not dealt with you in that way. Sometimes he might have given you a taste of what it is like to be in the world because you've kind of separated yourself. You've gone down a path, a course of action which is not sanctified. It's not wise. And the Lord has let you go down there for a time. You familiar with that experience? And you've become more acquainted with the guilt and the shame and the isolation and the alienation that your sin actually deserves. Because the Lord treating you still as a child he loves for a time, as it were, gives you over to your sin so that you may taste the bitter root of sin and repent and return. Sometimes he gives the Christian, as he does here with Lot, though actually 
Experientially, there's not much evidence that Lot learned this lesson right now. But later he probably does. That God gives us over to our sins to bring us to our knees, to show us his great mercy. Brethren, this is the stuff of conversion. It's the stuff also of fatherly chastening. And perhaps some of you can look back on those times in your lives where you've gone down that path and strayed from the Lord only for the Lord to bring you back. Or perhaps you're there right now. Perhaps you're there right now. If you are, repent quickly before it gets more painful. Because if you're a child of God, it will get painful. But I also want to say this. It's part of God's mercy and God's grace that he allows you to taste your sin so that he can turn you back unto himself. And so, brethren, don't despise those times. Don't despise those times where you failed. Don't despise those times where you've suffered. Don't despise those times where even you've sinned and you've been shrouded in shame. If you're a child of God, God has is and will use them to your eternal good. In other other words, he will sanctify even your sins and their products in your life. It's by the mercy of God that you've been afflicted. Oh, that's true. It's by the mercy of God that you've been afflicted. Because he could have just given you up to your sin. And so the mercy of God in pursuing his children is shown here clearly. Secondly, Lot and Abraham are a picture of salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ. Lot's a picture of a sinner, of course. He's actually in captive, in captivity. Two sinners here in this narrative. And we're led from Abraham then to Melchizedek in the next passage to our Lord Jesus Christ. Consider Lot as a picture of the sinner wandering far from God. He's on the path of destruction. At least he brings that into his own home. And Abraham comes against all odds, as it were, and rescues and delivers him. Lot is hopeless. Lot is helpless. And Abraham, the Redeemer, comes to him, pursues him, chases after him. And brings him back unto himself. And as Abraham came after Lot, so too has our Lord Jesus chased and pursued after sinners. Sinners like you and me. Helpless. Hopeless. In the world. And our Savior has come after us. Abraham came after Lot in comparative weakness. One king against four. In like manner, our Lord came with the appearance of weakness. Christ did not raise an army. Christ did not even raise a sword to bring about salvation. He came alone. Even his twelve deserted him in one way or another. Rather, he came with the power of a pure and righteous life and a death of ultimate and infinite value. Those were his weapons, not the weapons of the world, but the weapons of Christ. And just as Abraham destroyed Lot's enemies, so does our Lord Jesus Christ come into our lives to destroy our enemies. Lot, you see, was taken into captivity, which is what we are born in, brethren. We're born in captivity to sin, the world, the flesh, the devil. And our Lord has come to destroy our enemies also in his life and in his death. Christ did not face four kings. He faced the whole host of Satan's armies and hordes. And he faced down Satan himself personally many times over and crushed his head at the cross. Which is interesting because the same thing is said of the Christian in Scripture also. Romans 16 verse 20. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. Union with Christ means that what our Lord, in some way we enter into it. 
And if our Lord crushed Satan's head at the cross, it is also true that he has been crushed in our lives. The God of peace is crushing and will crush Satan under our feet. And it's not just that he went up the enemy against the enemies of evil. On the cross, Christ, as it were, became the enemy of his Father and faced all the wrath of God. He said, let this cup pass from me if that is possible. And God said, it's not possible. It's not possible. And Christ drank the dregs of that cup. So for the Christian, it can now be said, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. It can be said again, Romans chapter 8, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus because God is never angry with his children as he was with our Lord on the cross. Do you see how Christ has defeated each one of our enemies? Even in a sense, our righteous enemy God. That while we were in sin, we remained children of wrath. Now we are children of the King. And more than that, Lot was not just delivered from the pain of captivity but all his possessions were restored. We read that also, did we not, in verse 16. All his possessions restored. So too does our Lord come, bringing full restoration, and we might say greater improvement of our earthly estate. In salvation, not only does he cast down our enemies, but elevates us back up to that Adamic estate and improves that Adamic estate by giving us immortality. So we can read this, that Christ, who inherits the world and reigns over the world, we read this of ourselves. The church, they will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads and night will be no more. They will need no light of lamp or sun for the Lord God will be their light and they, the church, you, will reign forever and ever. We see what we have before us, brethren. Yes, we can look at our great father Abraham, see his faith, see his transformation, and learn from it the power of the Holy Spirit working in our lives. But I suggest we ought to look beyond Abraham and look to our Father in heaven who has willed and who has enacted our salvation, our safe refuge, our full inheritance, and our hope of glory. Brethren, to him be all the glory. Amen. Let's pray. Our great God, we bless and magnify you. We honor you for your great goodness to us. Truly, we can say with hands on our hearts that we have not honored you as we ought. We have not trusted you as we ought, and we have not done that which you commanded us to do. And so have mercy upon us this day, that we, your people, might know of your great work in our lives, that we might turn from sin and pursue righteousness. We give you thanks, even now as we come to your table, for all your great love and care for us. In Jesus' name, amen.